He will be back this evening. So <laughs> he went back to Prostel. They had the homecoming service today, and they asked him to come back. So we're excited that he uh, he went, and and I'm excited to be here with y'all today. Today, my prayer is that we'll pr provide an environment that we can worship uh, God in heaven, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and two that we uh, we can hear the word spoken to it to us today, and three that we might be a witness. To, to one another and to someone else uh, in this church. And last but not least, that we might respond to God today in whichever way God asks uh, for you to respond. We're going to start our service this morning or continue our service by singing page two, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let's all remain standing.
Olive Choir will sing Water of Life, and then following the choir special, Miss Joy Kaiser is going to come bless your heart with special music. The song Water of Life is uh, a story of, about, it's not really a story, it's a narrative about a, someone who, who met Jesus Christ uh, at the well. And of course, Jesus knew everything about this Samaritan woman and uh, told her things that no one could have known except for God or, or Jesus. And uh, this water of life that we're singing about today is, is a living well and it, it will never dry up and we just our hope and prayer for for everyone here today is that they know jesus and uh, that he is our water of life She came thirsty, the woman at the well, a soul in search of answers, crying out for help. The stranger saw the longing deep within, and told her of a water where she'd never thirst again.
been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's the pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. And we've all run to things we know just ain't right. Well, there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's the pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, He's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, Somebody testify, testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, or saving, well, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you need freedom, or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Yes, he is. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. The Gospel of Mark, chapter number 8. It's a marvelous chapter and much teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ gives his disciples and, and those who are just in the crowd and also teaching for us today. We're going to begin reading in um, verse number 34. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And we'll read through to the end of the chapter. If you're able to stand, I'll ask you to do so. Just a few verses. If you can't stand, just remain seated. Follow along with us as we read God's Word. This is God's holy, infallible, inerrant Word. When He had called the people to Himself with His disciples also, He said to them, Whoever desires to come after Me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whosoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory 
of his Father with the holy angels. Father, we thank you for your word today. We ask you to bless the reading of it. Speak to our hearts, Father, and help us to respond to you faithfully. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The teaching of the Bible is that of paradox. Jesus said if you want to save your life, you have to lose your life. If you want to find your life, you have to leave the old life certainly behind. What does it profit you, Jesus said, if you gain the whole world but you lose your own soul? He's talking about the temporal versus the eternal. If you just want to gather things unto yourself and get everything this world has to offer... I mean, what in the world would, does, does that compare to, to eternity and to being with the Lord forever? And, of course, we know as God's children there certainly is no comparison, but the pull of the world and the ways of the world are to those who are without Christ and even to those who are with Christ. There is that pull. There is that temptation uh, that is there. Jesus is talking not only to his disciples but also to the followers, to the crowds who have come, those that he fed, some 4,000, actually more than 4,000, 4,000 plus uh, women and children. And uh, they were listening to the words of Jesus as he spoke, as he preached, as he taught. So Jesus had a pretty plain message then for all of those hearers. If you desire to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and let him follow me. I was thinking about that word follow, and um, I'm not real big on social media. I have a Facebook account, and I look at Facebook some, and I do happy birthdays to everybody who's friends of mine, unless I happen to forget it, which is very rare. I don't do Twitter or Snapchat or any of those things. But I understand that Twitter has followers. Is that right? Somebody tell me. Yes, okay. My wife's over here. Yes, family. Yes, followers on Twitter. So I was one of the last ones, though, to to go to social media and even start texting and that sort of thing. And it took me a while to figure out the slang, to figure out, you know, some of the things that uh, you find on social media. It took me a while to figure out what LOL was. I said, lol, what is that? And I just got you to laugh out loud, so good. So I'm learning. I know a little bit more about that. And so then um, I look sometimes when, when someone posts something on Facebook, they'll ask a question or look for a recommendation or something like that, and I started seeing people that would come on there in a reply and just say, follow. And I thought, well, what do they mean by that, following? And then I finally figured out, you know, they're just waiting to see other people have to say because they have question on their mind. They've got the same thing on their mind. They want to know what other people think, what other people have to say. So they're following to see what's going to be said, if they can get a recommendation or a question answered that they have as well. Now Jesus said, yes, follow me. He wants followers. But sometimes followers are people who are just out there waiting to see what other people say or looking to see what other people do, or to hear what uh, other people are involved in. And so I thought in my mind, you know, there are a lot of people that are following Christians. You know why they're following us on Facebook and social media and at work and at play and other places? They want to see what we have to say. They want to see how we react to situations and issues. They're following us because they want to know if what we say we believe, that we really live that out in our lives every day. And so when you have followers, you better watch what you say and watch what you do and watch how you act. And really, if you're a true follower of Jesus Christ, which is a disciple, which is what we'll talk about in a few minutes, then it's not really about watching what you say and watching what you do and watching where you go. It's just about living out the life of a disciple every day. It's about loving Jesus and loving others, and that comes so natural to you that people, when they look at your life, they either know, number one, if you're doing something right, 
that you're doing it for God's glory and for not your own. Or number two, if you do something wrong, they still know that you're genuine because you understand when you do something wrong and you're willing to confess and willing to repent and willing to turn from that. Folks, that's a true follower. A true follower of Jesus Christ, a true disciple, is not someone who is perfectly sinless. But we all know and recognize that. There is none good, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What we know is that God is looking for people who will be a man or a woman after his own heart. Because when you look at David in the Old Testament, you find a man who was an adulterer, he lied, he murdered, uh, he committed all types of sin, and yet God still said, this is a man after my own heart. Because he was a man who loved God and loved others, and yes, he made mistakes from time to time. Yes, he sinned, not more than a mistake, I don't really like calling it mistakes, it's sin. He sinned, and yet he lived in God's forgiveness and God's grace and recognized God's work in his life, he also recognized that you suffer consequences for the sins that you commit, and you have to live with those consequences. And yet, being a follower, being a disciple, again, is living in light of the grace that God has given you and recognizing who God is and who we are. Who God is and who we are. And so as Jesus is speaking here to this this, uh, group group of people who've come just to listen, and the disciples that he has called out unto himself, we recognize something about Jesus' teaching. He doesn't sugarcoat. He tells it plain. He always puts it out there just like it is. And so he's teaching about what it means to be a committed, sold-out disciple, follower of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus knows, as we learn from the Bible, that there is no place in the life of a disciple or the life of the church for selfish attitudes, for disobedience, or being untrue to your calling. So that's the calling God places upon the life of a disciple. And so in this verse and and in this passage, Jesus gives us a very plain and serious description of what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple, not to be as... um, As one great scholar said once about a a young man, uh, someone came to him and said, so-and-so tells me that he is one of your students. And the teacher looked at that man and said, he may have attended my lectures, but he's not really one of my students. You understand the difference? And so you can come and listen to a sermon. You can sit in a Sunday school class and listen to a lesson But to be a student means that you are committed and sold out to being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what it means to be a true sold-out disciple. So three things, at least three things that Jesus says here uh, about what it means to be a true disciple that I want to share with you. It comes straight from the text. It's what we call a textual message. Number one is giving up our selfish ways. Jesus said, if any man desires, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself. Now, we live in a world where we don't want to deny ourselves anything that we want. We want to have all the pleasures that the world has to give. We want all the comforts. We want all the bells and whistles. We want all of everything today. We don't really like denying ourselves anything. But here's the truth from God's Word. People have always been selfish. We've always been like sheep going our own way, always wanting what we want. Eve took the forbidden fruit. Why? Because she looked at it. It looked good to her eye. Yes, she was tempted by Satan, no doubt, but she looked at it. It looked good to her eyes. She thought it must taste good. It, surely it wouldn't be so bad just to take this one piece of fruit, and yet in her selfishness she did so, and Adam did as well. Look at King David that I mentioned earlier. Had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. Why? Because he was where he shouldn't have been, looking the way he shouldn't have looked. And when he did see, he should should have looked away rather than continued to look so that lust was born in his heart and he, he committed sin against God. He was the king and he could have whoever he wanted. And so it continues today. 
even in our lives, even sometimes in the life of the church, we want what we want, no matter the cost. We do what we want to do, and so many times we give God second place or third place or fourth place or maybe even no place at all in our lives. And we let everything come before worshiping and serving our Lord Jesus Christ and really just loving Him simply because we are selfish. We'd rather spend time on Sunday on the Lord's Day doing what we want to do rather than gathering with God's people and worshiping. We'd rather spend our time in the recliner watching TV than going out and knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus. We'd rather uh, work doing things that we like to do and want to do rather than letting God put a a good want to, a better want to in our hearts and in our lives to go out and serve Him by serving others. And we want what we want, when we want it, how we want it, whether or not it hurts our testimony with no thought if it's hurting even the witness of the church or not. Remember what Jesus said. I I love the way he said this. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And now here's the thing we think about with commandments. You know, we're under grace now. We're not under the law. We're under the New Testament, New Covenant, not under the Old. And in the Old, you know, it was all about keeping commandments, it seems. And in the New, it's all about the grace of God and all of that. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know why he said that? Because if you love him, you have no problem keeping his commandments. You have no problem doing what what Christ calls you to do. And the summary of what Christ calls you to do is love God and love people. And if you love God and love people, then you begin to suddenly give up your selfish ways and you become a true follower of Jesus Christ, a true disciple who is willing, willing to make some sacrifices in your own life for the good of the kingdom of God and for the good of others. That's what it means to deny ourselves. Jesus said, if you desire to come after me, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, give up those selfish ways. Deny yourself. And so he's plainly telling us that if we love him, we want to follow him, if we want to be a true disciple that makes a difference in a cold, dark, selfish world, then God's calling us to be salt and light, denying ourselves, our selfish desires, to sell out completely and totally to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that when we make that initial profession of faith in Jesus Christ, we we should have committed our lives into him totally, and there should be growth. There should be maturity in our lives. Doesn't mean we won't go backwards sometimes or fail sometimes, but there should be that maturity in our lives so that we are not just one to come and attend a lecture or attend a service, but that we're a student of the Word and we're a lover of God and a lover of people more than we are lovers of self. That's what it means to deny self. I know it's convicting. I know it's convicting for my own life as well. I want to be a follower. I want to deny Myself, I want to learn more how to do that. I want to have a desire to follow Jesus Christ and give up my selfishness and not look to my own comforts, but to look to love Jesus and to love people. And if you have trouble with that like I do, remember Jesus said, all power, and all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And if you ask... And if you seek, and if you knock, then then you will find, you will find the power, the strength that you need to give up those selfish ways, to deny yourself and follow Jesus and be a real disciple. Number two, what is following following the verse? Let him deny himself. And take up his cross. Now what does it mean to take up your cross? So I've heard people say over the years, taking up your cross uh, or bearing your cross is uh, if you're sick and you're going through some trouble or some problem and all of that. Now now that's a burden to bear, no doubt about it. We need God's strength in that. We need God's help in that. But I want you to know, taking up the cross is much more than that. I mean, let's think about what the cross is. And let's think about what the cross means. Let's think about a a Savior. Let's think about the Son of God who hung upon that cross. Criminals were hung on a cross. 
Criminals were crucified on the cross. Criminals suffered intensely because of what they had done, what they had done wrong. But now here's the Son of God, here's Jesus Christ who had done no wrong. He was accused, yes. He was tried and found guilty, but he was not guilty. And he had never committed not one sin. And yet he took up his cross. And he carried that cross all the way to Calvary. Well, he fell under the weight and someone was compelled to help him. But he bore that cross. And he bore our sins on that cross. And so the cross, it, it, was, it was identified with suffering. It was identified with shame and all of those things. And so Jesus teaching here, obviously had not even gone to the cross yet, but he knew what the cross was going to mean for him and what the cross would mean for us even 2,000 years later. And he says, so if any man desires, desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. And we don't take up Jesus' cross. He did that. He bore it to Calvary in full obedience to the Father. We don't have to take up someone else's cross. Jesus said, take up your cross, your cross. And Jesus' way of glorifying the Father and doing all that God had planned to have done was taking up that cross and going to the cross. That's why Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto whom the world is crucified to me, and I to the world. So how is it that we glorify God to the maximum? How is it that we take up our cross? We do so in obedience to Christ, identifying with Jesus, identifying with his suffering, with his shame. And we clearly and voluntarily choose to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. God doesn't push us into that. He draws us by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we commit ourselves to identify with Jesus with the Savior. So you look at his life in the Gospels. Look at how he lived his life on this earth. The perfect God-man, perfect as God, of course, but also perfect as man, sinless in every way, showing compassion, mercy, and love, but also preaching the Gospel, teaching the truth of God's Word. Again, not sugarcoating anything, letting people know that the way that leads home is the way of the cross. It's the way of the cross. It's the only way. Denying self and taking up the cross, it is our choice. Chuck Swindle put it this way. He said, by making us in his image, God gave us capacities not given to other forms of life. Ideally, he made us to know him, to love him, and to obey him. He did not put rings in our noses like oxen to be led around. No, he gave us freedom to make choices. By His grace, we were equipped to understand His plan, and we have a mind which we can know Him. We are also free to love Him and adore Him because we have emotions. He takes pleasure in our affection and our devotion. We can obey His instructions, but we're not pawns in a global chessboard. It is the voluntary spontaneity of our response that He finds pleasure in. And when people freely respond in worship and praise and obedience and adoration, God is glorified to the maximum. Take up the cross in obedience to Christ, to following his way and identifying with him, not identifying with the ways of the world. That's why people ought to know that you and I are different. That's why when we go to the ball game and we set up in the stands, people ought to know that that a Christian's not going to stand up and start cursing and throwing stuff at the referee, like I've seen some do. That's why when we go to work, we don't engage in telling dirty jokes and talking filthy language. People ought to know that we love Jesus, and by taking up the cross, we're identifying with Christ and His obedience to do everything right. And again, as we don't do everything right, we still have forgiveness and grace and mercy, and we are following the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience, denying self and taking up the cross, taking up our cross to follow and love and and serve and identify with Jesus Christ and do it willingly. That's why Jesus said, if any man desire to come after me, let him deny himself and take up 
his cross. Are you taking up the cross every day? Can people see there's a difference in your life because you identify with the Son of God, with Jesus Christ our Lord? And then thirdly and finally, we'll follow the Scripture. Take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. So this is where the following comes in. As I said, I've been pondering those two words, thinking about those words. And I'm reminded that the Bible tells us that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two fishermen. And he said to those fishermen, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And when he said, I'll make you fishers of men, those fishermen knew what it meant to fish. Fishing was hard work. Fishing was toiling. Fishing was giving your all. To the profession that you had chosen. Fishing was you've got to get the net out there. And you've got to cast it if you're going to catch anything. And you've got to keep those nets mended and washed and ready and prepared. And as fishers of men we've got to keep our lives washed and ready and prepared. If we're going to follow Jesus Christ. I mean in those days there was some hook fishing like we do. But most of it was net fishing. And it was hard work. It was difficult work. It was committed work. If we're going to be committed to be fishers of men, then Jesus said, follow me. You've got to follow me. And they were willing to do that. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother and James and John. To a disciple that, or or one that wanted to be a disciple and said to Jesus, you know, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father. What he meant was, let me go stay with my family until my father dies. And then when that happens, I will come and I will will follow you. And Jesus' response was, follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. What he meant was, be sold out in following me. If you want to follow me, you've you've got to follow me all the way. Speaking to a rich young man, Jesus said, hey, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be right, then sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and come, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. That rich young ruler went away sad and sorrowful because he, he was rich. He had, he had much possessions. And if you want to be a disciple and a follower, Jesus says, not that you have to go write, write a check out, you know, to to the church or missionaries or whatever, give away every penny of money that you have. But he meant you you must be sold out for me. If you want treasure in heaven, don't trust the riches of the world. Come and follow me. To a hated tax collector named Matthew, Jesus simply said in an invitation, follow me. And he got up and followed. To a repentant and broken disciple named Peter, Jesus disclosed that, hey, you're going to have to die a horrible death. You're going to follow me. In the way of death, on a cross. But he still welcomed Peter. Come and follow me. Be true to the calling in your life to follow me. Be true to that calling. And those words and all of that informs me and says to me that I must be true to the calling that God has placed upon my life to be a disciple. And I don't know why sometimes we get it all mixed up on calling and we say, well, I'm not called to be a preacher. I'm not called to be a teacher. I'm not called to lead music. I'm not called to lead youth. Well, that's, that's right. But every one of us have a calling. And Paul put it this way. Be worthy of the calling wherewith you have been called. And that calling, that vocation of, of calling, was a calling to follow Jesus. It was a call to the Christian life. It was a call to be a disciple of Christ. And that's what Jesus is doing right here. It's a call to follow him and to be true to that calling. And finish well and, and go all the way. And Jacob just told me this story yesterday and he said it in Sunday school. And I'm going to tell it now. He went to visit Mr. Neal, Mr. Neal Wallace in the, in the nursing home. And Jacob said, the first thing he asked was, how are things going at church? How are things going at Mount Olive Church? Here's a man who's finishing well. He loves Jesus. He loves the church. He loves his family. He loves people. He's true to the calling of the Christian life. Miss Clara is with us today.
Ms. Claire, we're so glad to have you. She's been a member of this church over 70 years. She told me back there in the back, I'm not... I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to heaven, being a member of Mount Olive Baptist Church. This is where God's called me. This is where God's placed me, and God's put a call on her life to be a Christian, to live the Christian life and follow. And she is following that well. I pray that we'll all be true to the calling that God has placed upon our lives. The calling to be a disciple, a real disciple of Jesus Christ, to deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow Jesus. Don't follow me. Don't follow me. Don't follow any man. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Let's be true to the calling that God has placed upon our lives. Let's give up our selfish ways. Let's identify with Jesus so that people know that we belong to Christ, that we are a Christian, that we love the Lord. And whatever happens in our lives, whatever we do for good is for God's glory. And as I often tell people, if you hear anything bad about me, I'll take the blame. If you hear anything good, give God the glory. Because God deserves the glory And I deserve the consequence of the bad that I do. And yet, His grace covers me. It covers me. And our Sunday school lesson this morning in Nehemiah, where the report was, and Judy and I talked about this right at the end of class, where the report was that those who were working on the wall and the enemies were coming after them, and the report was, every way you turn, Every way you turn, the enemy is there. You know what that means? I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by the enemy. Everywhere I turn, I'm surrounded by the enemy. But here's the thing to remember. As the new Michael W. Smith song says, this is how I fight my battles. When I'm surrounded... I'm surrounded by you. As a true follower of Jesus Christ, as a real disciple who's learning, believe you me, I'm still learning to deny myself and to take up my cross and to follow him. I want to be true to my calling. And I know you do too. And Jesus is there. And the Holy Spirit is within us. He is giving us the power to overcome. And the Bible said there in that lesson in chapter 4 of of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah said to the people, when the enemy attacks and you hear the trumpet sound, come and gather together. You gather together and God will fight for us. God will fight for us. Let's pray. Father, what this world throws at us so often surrounds us and makes us fearful. We seem we have nowhere to turn. When we turn, we see the enemy. But I pray that today, this moment, your Holy Spirit is teaching us that we are surrounded by your love, your watch care, your protection. That we are in your hand. And you have hid us in the cleft of the rock. As your goodness passes by. We're grateful Father today. For our Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave his life. Perfect. Sinless. Without spot. And without blemish. On that cruel cross of Calvary. Taking our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. And though we recognize that righteousness, of course, is not righteousness of our own. It is the righteousness of Christ that's been credited to us, given to us by your marvelous grace. We fall before you this morning in worship. Our hearts bowing down to you, Father. Asking for your power and your strength and your help to be a real disciple to give up our selfish ways, to identify with Christ and his shame and suffering and who he is, and being true to the calling 
of the Christian life that you have placed on all of your children here this morning. But I'm, I recognize, Father, there may be some here today without Jesus. They've never trusted him. And when they're surrounded, they have nowhere to, to look, no, seemingly no hope. And yet help them to know they can look to you, Father. And in you find their hope and their peace and their joy and their strength. Only through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and repentance of our sins, turning from our old way of life to trust Jesus. Father, save here today, we beg you, Lord. And our prayer today for your disciples, Lord, is that we would not deny you before men. But, Father, we would give our testimony of your goodness and your grace towards us and towards all. So that when Jesus does come from heaven with the holy angels, we will not be denied, but accepted and know that we belong to you. Father, give that peace and strength here today. Lord, I recognize there are many here today who are hurting for various reasons and in different situations. And Lord, the hurt is real and you know that. And Father, we pray for them and lift them up. Lord, we pray for all of us who are struggling with sin, temptation, or whether it's the sin of apathy, the sin of omission, or the sin of commission, where we're actively involved in some sin we know we shouldn't be, Lord. Help us to repent to confess, to be a man and a woman after your own heart by knowing how to repent and how to turn to you. Father, have your will and way right now. That's our sincere prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of response. I ask you to bow your heads with me just a moment as Monty plays softly, heads bowed, eyes closed, just for another minute or so. I'm not trying to prolong this and not trying to manipulate you in any way, but I want to give you the response, the time to respond to the Lord that you need. I feel the Holy Spirit strong in this place. I know God's always here when we meet together. I hear people say sometimes, God really showed up today in a service when you have a, a good service and a lot of folks are moving. Well, really, biblically, God is always here with us. We're not going to feel the effects of his blessing and his calling unless we're obedient, unless we're surrendered to him, unless we are open and honest with God. That's when we see things happen. Let's be open and honest with him today about the need that you have in your life. He already knows, but 
He just wants us to open up and admit that, agree with him about it. If you need to come and kneel at the altar and pray, you can come do that. I'll be glad to pray with you and help you from God's word. If you're lost, I'm begging you to give your heart and life to Jesus. Don't walk out of here without the peace and comfort and joy that you need in knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. One day we're all going to die. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but we know it's true. We're all going to die. Unless Jesus comes back and translates his church, we're going to see death. We're going to taste death. The question then becomes, what's going to happen at that moment? When you close your eyes from this life and open them to the next, where will you be? The Bible's plain. There's only two destinations, heaven or hell. The broad way that leads to destruction or the narrow way that leads to life. And Jesus said it this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Nobody's going to slip past. Nobody's going to sneak their way in. Either Jesus will be holding his arms open wide for you to come home, or you'll be in forever torment in a devil's hell, away from God's presence, his gracious presence. Which will it be? It's a great paradox. You've got to lose your life to find it. If you want to save your life, you have to die to the old way of life and trust Jesus. Trust Him. Trust Him now. How about we sing that chorus one more time? Well, as always, I thank you and appreciate your prayers in the service, the way that you listen, the way that you respond to the Lord. I'm so grateful for our church family that loves the Lord and is going to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and so I thank you for that. For our guests, we're always honored to have you. We want you to know that. I want you to feel welcome here at Mount Olive Baptist Church. And we want you to come and worship with us any time that you can. And I know we have several that are visiting in town with family, and so we're grateful for you. And then um, we have some visiting as well uh, that live in our community. And if you're looking for a church home, we would love to, to pray with you. God's leading you here. We, we would welcome you as a part of our Mount Olive family. So, again, we're glad to have Miss Claire with us. And Miss Claire's got a birthday coming up next Sunday, right? And so, yeah. And so next Sunday, Miss Clara's age will be one year older than she is right now. I mean, hey, I'm not dumb. I learned uh, you don't talk about ladies' ages. But she's grateful for every year she has. Right, Miss Clara? Yeah, yeah. You. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Thank you for that faithfulness. Yes. Amen. That's right. So I know some of you couldn't hear that, but here's what she said. She said, I lean on him every day, and I've got a Bible, and I get in that Bible and read that Bible every day, and she's thankful that the Lord uses that to get her through, and uh, she trusts him. So thank you, Miss Claire, for that testimony this morning. All right. Yes, ma'am. All right. Any other word this morning before we dismiss? This afternoon, we'll look forward to a discipleship training at 5.30 and then worship at 6.30. I think that's all that I know of. Y'all keep me straight. Deacons will meet after church tonight. All right. Hope you have a great afternoon. All right. Put the Lord first in your life, and I hope to see you in God's house tonight. All right. Let's bow together. We'll have our closing prayer. Robbie, will you lead us, please?